Good morning, everybody. Let's just start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for all you've given us, all you've done for us. We thank you for what your son did on the cross for us, Lord, that um, through him we can be made holy and righteous, that we can uh, be made a new man. And, um, Father, we just thank you for all the things that have been going on in this country uh, this past week, and we just give you all the praise and glory. In Christ's name, amen. So... There's a lot of things going on this week. And I guess the biggest thing is um, the Supreme Court overruled Roe versus Wade, which is a victory for little babies. And I don't care what anybody says, uh, abortion is not health care for women. Um, it is murder. And those doctors that uh, do abortions, they're murderers. And now the Supreme Court, and uh, whatever you think of Donald Trump, he's the one that got three Supreme Court justices on there, conservative justices that overturned this, um, along with Clarence Thomas. And I think Clarence Thomas is probably the probably one of the greatest uh, judges we have on there forever. I mean, I don't know if you remember way back, I don't know when it was, 91 or something, when he was going through that thing with Anita Hill. And um, they just, you know, they made that man look like a fool, but he, he's, he's really a, a great uh, justice. So, so I looked up a few things about... Um, abortion, and um, I'll just read them off real quickly. It says, women's reasons for seeking an abortion fell into 11 broad themes. Uh, the predominant themes identified as reasons for seeking an abortion included financial reasons, 40 percent, timing, 36 percent, partner-related reasons, 31 percent, and the need to focus on other children, 29%. And then I found this thing, this is a, a Florida survey, I guess, they surveyed women. And their percentages were uh, rape, 0.5%, uh, fetal health problems, 3%, physical health problems, 4%, uh, would interfere with education or career, 4%. Not mature enough to raise a child, 7%. Don't want to be a single mother, 8%. Done having children, 19%. Can't afford a baby, 23%. Not ready for a child, 25%. Another was 6%. So, um, you know, the main reasons uh, p women get abortions are for convenience. They just don't want the baby. But, um, and I don't know if you saw Nancy Pelosi and um, Elizabeth Warren and all these liberals that were just crying and saying this is a dark day for America, you know. But just think of all the little babies that are going to be saved through this. I mean... There's been like 50 million since 1973 that have been murdered. And when we got first saved, um, um, we, we watched this movie called Silent Scream. I don't know if anybody's ever seen that. But it shows an actual abortion taking place. And, you know, I couldn't even watch it all. I, I had to leave. I, I don't know if Marie watched it or not, but... I couldn't do it, and it's, it's just terrible. It's, it's murder, so, um, you know, our country, and um, again, the um, uh, second, second Amendment rights for um, 
you know, uh, carrying a, a handgun for protection. Uh, they ruled on that, so you don't have to jump through hoops to get it. And I think even in um, Indiana, starting in July 1st, that you can carry a handgun without a permit in Indiana. So, um, so you know, the Supreme Court's um, doing their job, and it's just a great day for America. It's not a sad day, as President Biden said. Um, so I wanted to read this thing, and you know, the whole, the, the whole world is uh, Boris Johnson and Trudeau and uh, the French president, they're all saying, you know, this is putting us back in the dark ages, and they're, they're totally, you know, the whole world is against, you know, the, the conservatives that want, you know, life. And it's just globalism. And um, a couple weeks ago, Pastor did this thing on globalism. And I, I want to read a few things from here and comment on them before I get into uh, my subject today. Um, the first civilization which perished in the judgment of the flood was Canaanitic in origin, character, and de destiny. Um, in Genesis 10, 8 through 10, it says, And Cush begat Nimrod. He began, to, he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore, it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, in the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, a mighty hunter, one who could supply all meat, all the meat you wanted. You could live in a city and the government will supply all your needs. You don't need to provide for yourself. You don't need weapons to defend yourself. You don't need to work. And if you look at the world today, that's what they want. The United States, they want everybody, they want the government to provide everything for them. And there was a movie, Soyant Green, I don't know if anybody's seen that movie, with Charlton Heston, and he was like a police officer, and this movie was made in 1973, and it's supposed to be like um, in 2021 or 22, something like that. And it's about the government, you know, uh, supplying everything for the, for the poor people. The rich people had, you know, the rich people got all the meat, the vegetables, the fruits, and everything. But the poor people, uh, they had to rely on soy and green for their nourishment. So every Tuesday was soy and green day. And people would go there with big jugs and get um, soy and green water, whatever it was. And they get crackers and all this processed stuff. Well, it comes to find out, um, they also had assisted suicide where you could go to a place, you know, and if you wanted to die, the government would kill you off. And um, Charlton Heston, one of his, his friend, went there to, you know, to die. So um, he went around the, after, you know, he talked to his friend and he died, he went around the back, he was leaving, and he saw these big garbage trucks. And he was seeing all these bodies being taken out of there, put in these garbage trucks. So he sneaks on one of the trucks and takes, and you know, they take him to this plant where they're processing all these bodies. <laughs> they're making, you know, uh, juice or whatever and all this other stuff. So come to find out that soy and green is really dead human bodies that they're making. And, <laughs> You know, it makes me think because, you know, I talk to my sister all the time and we were talking about, you know, um, and down here, you know, um, later on down here, you know, Pastor talks about um, little mom and pop, you know, grocery stores. And when we lived on O'Brien Street, um, we had two, 
One was called uh, Stans and one was called Clems. You know, good Polish guys. Yeah. And, you know, you could go there and you could, you know, you could go in there and go to the back to the uh, meat counter and they had such good bologna there. Now, I like bologna, but uh, the bologna you get today, I don't know what they're putting in it. But I, I got some bologna the other day and I, I took a couple of bites. I couldn't eat it because it's so terrible. Oh, the deli. But these mom and pop shops, we, you know, we would go and then we moved to O'Brien Street and there was another little store down the couple blocks down that we could go to. And all those are, you know, like Pastor says here, they're all gone. You can't find any little, you got to go to, you know, Walmart or Martin's or somewhere like that. Um, God doesn't want globalism, which works toward having one government, everybody under one language, under one tent. This is why our nation has been such a threat. Our nation is built on the ideal of not top-down government, but bottom-up. This is the opposite of globalism. This is the purpose for the push to get the U.S. along with the rest of the world under a system of one-world government government control, organizations like the United Nations, the World Ethnic Forum, um, World Health Organization, and the Governmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, and I know everybody doesn't like Donald Trump, but the one thing he did do is he tried to, he got rid of, you know, he got us out of the United Nations and all this world globalism stuff and it just pushed it back a little bit and now we're going towards globalism again um, and like Paul says you know in 2nd Timothy parables times will come and it's going to be time after time you know it might be put back and then we're going to have perilous time again but um It says here, globalism is a sinister underdemanding of nationalism. This is the condition whereby God will cut off the grace program. This, is, this does not mean that every Gentile no longer believes. It means globalism will allow the corporate activity, the corporate decision of the nations. And, um, you know, I always used to think that, you know, it was going to be... Um, the rapture was going to take place when that last Gentile would be saved. But according, you know, according to uh, this, it makes a lot of sense because, um, you know, we're in the dispensation of grace. So where, you know, sin abounded, grace abounded more. So how can, how can we say that, you know, God's got to cut us off because of that? But, um, I don't know, I just thought it was pretty interesting to uh, go over that again. Um, let's see. Oh, well. So if you would turn to Genesis chapter 2. And I'll pick up where I left off last time. Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And this is um, the two times God rested. In chapter 2 it says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that, that in it he rested from all his work which God created and made. Now, God didn't get tired when he created the world. Um, he just finished it. And he was done making a perfect world. I mean, everything was perfect in it. The animals, uh, man... Um, everything he created uh, was perfect. 
But then something happened in Adam, sin. So we have in Romans, you don't have to turn there, in Romans 5, uh, 12, it says, By one man sent into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. And um, it's interesting because, you know, Adam didn't have a sin nature. When he was created, you know, he was perfect. But he had the free will to choose if he wanted to uh, sin or not. So we see here that, you know, um, that Adam chose to sin. And uh, it says, because he sinned, it fell upon all men. Now, if you turn to Luke chapter 1, and Luke chapter 1, I'm going to start at verse 39. The Catholic Church says that Mary was born without sin. And, um, you know, that can't, that can't be true because the word says all, were, all are sin, have sin. So let me start at verse 39 of chapter 1. It says, And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into the city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted, saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leapt in, leapt in her room, and Elizabeth was, was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my wound for joy. Right there it tells you that a baby is alive in the wound. It's not just some piece of tissue that's laying there. I mean, it's a human being. Um, and blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. So Mary recognized that she needed a Savior. And... Um, it just goes to show you that, you know, the Catholic Church is wrong. I mean, Catholic Church, I, Catholic Church is wrong about a lot of things, but... Um, um, let's go over to um, Chapter 3 of Genesis. Chapter 3 of Genesis, and I'll start at verse 6. And when the women saw that the, tr the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired, and to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave un also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them were both open, and they knew that they were naked. And they and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So, you know, we really don't know what the fruit was that they ate, or what it was. Most people say it was an apple. Um, I kind of think, I don't know, this is just my thought, it could have been a fig or maybe grapes because, you know, as soon as they sinned, they took, they took fig leaves and made aprons, you know, to cover themselves. Um, Fig leaves were right there, probably, and maybe it was a fig. I don't know. Um, but um, if you turn, keep your hand there 
and turn to Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61 and verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom, decketh himself with ornaments as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. So, um, the garments of salvation, if you go back to Genesis now, uh, and we see that in um, Genesis um, 3, in verse 21, you know, he says, Unto Adam and to his wife did the Lord make coats of skins and clothe them. So, um, God had to, you know, physically kill an animal, slit its throat, shed its blood, and make them, you know, coats of skins. Um, so why, why did God have to do that? I mean, why, why couldn't he just, you know, say you're okay? Well, if you turn... Uh, to Leviticus 17. Keep your place in Genesis and go to Leviticus. I know there's a lot of turning pages today, but... Leviticus chapter 17. And verse 10. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers and sojourn among you, that he eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood, and will cut him off from among the people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh atonement for your soul. So right there in Genesis 3, God was telling them, if they sinned, they had to shed the blood of an innocent animal. Now, we're not supposed to eat blood. I like, I like my steak pretty rare. So, um, when I was a kid, my grandmother used to make this, it was called duck blood soup, chanina or something like that. And I can still taste it. It tasted pretty good. I mean, it was made up. And I don't know if this is true, but I heard that my grandfather had to go into the back of the stores because it was illegal to sell the duck blood or something. I don't know. I don't know if that's true or not, but it was like a racket or something going on there that, to make this stuff. But anyway, um, you know, it's the blood that saves us. It's Christ's blood that he shed on the cross that saves us. Um, let's go to um, Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, starting at verse 1. And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bore his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, and that phrase, in the process of time, in the Hebrew, it means um, after days of instruction. So, you know, I believe that Adam and Eve 
instructed their children, Cain and Abel, that you know, if one of them sinned or did anything, that they were supposed to br bring a blood sacrifice. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the first things of the flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very rough, and his countenance fell. So we see here that Abel brought the right sacrifice, a blood sacrifice, and uh, Cain brought the, uh, the fruits of his labor of tilling the ground. He was a farmer. The ground was cursed. I mean, he brought stuff that God's had, you know, he told him he couldn't do that. But Cain did it anyway because he wanted, you know, um, you know, the Bible says each man does right in his own mind or whatever, and it's, you know, you think, it, you think it's what God wants, but it's not. You have to go by what the book says. Um, if you go to Proverbs 14, Proverbs 14, verse 12. And here's, here's the verse. It says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And that's what religion does to people. You know, um, religion puts everybody under the law. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. You know, you've got to be baptized. You've got to speak in tongues. You've got to, um, you know, do the best you can. You've got to keep... You know, go to church every Sunday. All the laws that, you know, man, that religion makes up and gives you, um, that's what religion is. And as this passage says, that, you know, it seems right. I mean, you know, I went to Catholic Church for like, was it eight years? I think it was eight years. And, you know, it seemed very holy there. You know, they'd come in. You know, a lot of times with this incense, and I, I love to smell that incense. It, it kind of made you high or something. I don't know, but it was like, you know, it was weird. And then they had all the candlesticks and candles and, um, you know, the, the bread and the wine. And it's kind of, it, the Catholic Church has taken um, the things of Israel and the priests of what they did back there in the Old Testament uh, when they went into the, um, you know, the tabernacle, and they they took all that. That's all that is. I mean, it's it has nothing to do with you know honoring God, and um, you know the bread and the wine does not become the body and blood of Christ. I mean, um, you know that came from the early church fathers. They made all this stuff up to keep people under their thumb to keep the people um, doing what the Catholic Church wanted them to do. And, um, you know, in Hebrews it said, Christ died once. He doesn't die. And the Mass is, they believe that Christ dies every time they have the Mass. How can they do that when, when Christ was on the cross? He said it is finished. So, it's... Um, it's just religion that uh, trying to keep people under their thumbs. Um, let's see. If you go to Leviticus, back to Leviticus chapter 4. Leviticus chapter 4.
Leviticus chapter uh, 4, start at verse 1. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not be done, and he shall do against any of them. If the priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people, let him bring for his sin which he have sinned, a young bullock without blemish unto the Lord for a sin offering. And he shall bring the bullock into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord and shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head and kill the bullock before the Lord. And the priest that is anointed shall take of the bullock's blood and bring it to the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle it, sprinkle of the blood seven times before the Lord, before the veil of the sanctuary. And the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall pour all the blood of the bullock at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And it goes on um, through this chapter about uh, you can bring different offerings. Um, But, you know, that was Israel's program. They had to bring, when they sinned, they, uh, somebody sinned, they had to bring um, a sacrifice to the priest, and the priest would, um, you know, make the sacrifice for him. Again, that's like the Catholic Church, you know. You've got to go to, to the priest to confess your sins. And he gives you ab absolution, and supposedly your sins are forgiven. Well, that doesn't work either. Because only Christ forgave our sins. Our sins are not imputed to us today. You know, if you're in Christ, you know, yeah, we're going to sin. Uh, we don't have to sin. Because, you know, we're not under the law. Sin doesn't have dominion over us anymore. You know, we have the new creature in us, the new man. And if we sin, it's our choice. We can either yield to the spirit or yield to the flesh and sin. So, but, um, you know, that's what people had to do back there. Um, if you turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, um, verse, start at verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law of the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, who hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be the just and the justifier of him who believeth in, G in Jesus. So we see there that um, what Paul's telling us there that, you know, um, we have to have faith in his blood, what he did for us on the cross. Um, propitiation is, all it is is a fully sacrif satisfying sacrifice. That sacrifice that Christ did on the cross satisfied God that he would not, you know, pour out his wrath on us. And I don't care what anybody says. Uh, I believe in in hell and the lake of fire. 
And, um, you know, I had my granddaughters, you know, I, I talk with them, you know, a lot. And my one granddaughter said, you know, how can God send anybody to hell that never heard the gospel? And I tried to tell her that, you know, um, people do know there is a God. We're all, um, when we're born, we know there is a God. It's, it's put into us. And if people want to be, don't believe there's a God, um, that's their choice. Um, but, you know, there's things around us. Um, back here in, in um, Romans, it says that, you know, uh, we, can, we can see God in everything that's made, you know. Um, we have a conscience. We, we have a conscience to know what's right and wrong. And, um, and she said, well, you know, what if they never heard the gospel? You know, it says that, you know, men will be judged by the gospel. And, you know, I told her that, you know, um, God's a fair God, and he's going to make that decision. If nobody ever heard the gospel, they have inside them, they know that there is a God. And um, I don't know, it's, it's a hard question to answer, you know, a 17-year-old kid. Um, but, you know, we worry about the people that, that have the chance, you know, to uh, hear the gospel. And the gospel is simply, you know, that um, we know we're sinners and we know Christ died for our sin. He was buried and he rose again the third day. And when we believe that, that he did that for us, you know, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit and we're placed in the body of Christ, we're baptized into Christ, and we're made new creatures. And there's nothing more we can do. You know, you can't, there's nothing more to make you any more right with God than that. You know, we are made righteous by, by Christ's faith, by his holiness, by his righteousness. And, you know, even when we do sin, you know, it's not imputed to us because Christ took that. And it's interesting because you know, when he was on the cross and, you know, he was on the cross for uh, from nine o'clock to three o'clock and from 12 to three, they said there was darkness upon the earth. And, you know, what happened during that those three hours? Well, I'm not going to get into it right now, but I think this is my own opinion. I think Christ somehow, some way, took those sins and threw them into the lake of fire. Because the lake of fire is could be a black hole because nothing everything gets sucked into a black hole and nothing comes out and it's full of uh, fire, it's full of heat, and you know, right at the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way, there is a black hole. So I'm not saying that's true. I'm saying that's my own opinion. It could be. I don't know. Um, I'll find that out when I get when I get up there. But it's um, it's amazing what Christ did for us, and, and you know, all we have to do is believe it. So thank you for listening, and I'll have to finish this the next time. So let's cl close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that we can rely on your word and we trust your word. And um, everything that um, um, we read in your word edifies us, Lord, and, and uh, gives us uh, hope and comfort. We just pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.